and welcome back to the LIBF Trade Podcast. I'm Alex Gray, Head of Trade and Transaction Banking at LIBF. I'm happy to say I'm joined today by Klisman Murati from Pareto Economics, formerly Pangea Wire. And um, we, we spoke back in April 2020, so people may recognize his voice. We met at that time, uh, just prior to that, and the last time I got on a plane to go overseas, that was to Helsinki. And... Um, that, you know, that was just at the start of the the pandemic. And I uh, just wanted to just uh, speak to Kleisman about what he thinks has been happening in, in the past, what, 18, 19 months? Because you made some uh, predictions at that point. And um, I, I'm happy, I'm very happy to say, because you probably wouldn't be back if some of them were true, to be honest. They <laughs> weren't true. To review some of the things you talked about and uh, how your, your crystal ball was quite accurate. Do you want to cover that a wee bit? Sure. Thank you for having me back on, Alex. So when we spoke on Zoom last time, there seemed to be a consensus that wasn't really led by anyone, but was agreed on by everyone that there will be a definitive end date where we'll get back to normal. That word has been sort of the, the word of business since COVID happened around the world. But thinking how pandemics develop you know it's not as easy as signing a contract and having it finished so you may have a situation where in one country there could be a consensus that things are back to normal people are back to work but across the world that may not be the case and as we live in an interconnected world supply chains don't um don't listen to political decrees you know viruses don't stop because Boris Johnson says they stop or they don't stop because Biden says they stop so you you will continue have I said supply chain disturbances because you can't control what policies health policies a nation across the world has implemented but you suffer the consequences of mismanagement and this is what we're seeing with inflation of different you know products across the world and disturbances everywhere so this is something that we haven't really experienced in the world that we live in now which is so interconnected you can go back to the spanish flu i guess or back to smaller viruses across the world but they were more contained this one has really shocked the world politically, financially, economically, and for trade finance as well. So these uh, idioms that we created in the first place were reinforced or were reassessed by force, not because people wanted to change their mind. And this is the world that we're living in now, where we can't control what's happening in different parts of the world. You can only really control what, you, what you're doing as a nation state, as a company, and hope that everyone else takes precautions to smooth over the situation. I don't want to uh, trivialize what you're talking about, but in terms of impact to me, when I was reading the newspaper on the way in today, and I just hasten to add, I'm actually, I don't know if the listeners notice a, a difference in our tone, because we're actually in the same room. It's the first time we've done a podcast in the same room, and in the same room as Christian, our uh, our technical guy, he's, he's what's making the magic happen here with all the fancy equipment and we've taken a photo haven't we just to record this for prosperity in case right. we can't come back we all need a christian in our lives when you come to the podcast you know? exactly uh, if we had to rely on our tech skills we'd be, be rather desperate but uh, so um yeah so if people notice that we're not on zoom so it's great to be in in our offices um uh, back here in london um but you know when i was coming in today it, it was a, an article in the, in the times newspaper about you know the, the impact of these some things on, on our actual you know, we might have like a basket of goods, but in this case, it was an impact on our Christmas lunch. Um, and I, I talk about this selfishly because I'm actually going to be making Christmas lunch for my mum's my coming down to London. And uh, the good thing is, with, you know, my mum does, well, people who know my mum know uh, she likes to drink. The good thing is that that has not gone up in price, but all the other things have, the vegetables. Um, I, th I suppose the the drink not going up is because of the recent, the budget and the, 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 the taxes there have been changed. Uh, but the uh, the Christmas pudding has gone up. In fact, I bought a Christmas pudding the other day. I did check that it was the sell by date was going to be before was after Christmas Day because it was like the last one on the shelf. And I thought, right, I'd best buy this just in case it runs out. But it's all the other aspects, you know, have all gone up in price since the past year by way more than inflation. Now, and that's because of you know all the various factors we talked about, you know, uh, along the supply chain, whether that be various goods coming from different parts, the ingredients. Um, but that's just one thing I sort of noticed about the impact um, on, a, on a personal level. But it's just, there's more than that, isn't there? Mm. There's a lot of things happening in the world that, you know, you can't 
develop a macro strategy at the beginning without needing to change it as new facts come to be. I mean, because we run a podcast as well, not to take your audience away from you, but we <laughs> have one as well. And we have we've spoken to many sort of um, uh, CIOs of asset managers which hold, you know, multi-billions under management. And the macro thesis they had at the beginning by force needed to change. And if you don't have that dexterity in your teams to see and react and respond, then you're always going to be left on the back foot. I think that's what we're good at as a firm because you can't develop macro strategies out of just theory because something like a pandemic and its impact on finances, you know, the, fin the financial world can't stop what's happening because it's not a financial caused crisis. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a health caused crisis. Unlike 2008, which was, you know, made by the financiers could be cured by the financiers. This needs more, more thought, I think, because you can't control many of the variables. And if you can't control many of the variables, you need to be fluid in how you respond. And so, yeah, so in, in Prater Economics, you know, you, you told me before we started this that your previous name, Pangea, people couldn't pronounce that. And as a, as a geographer, I like the concept of Pangea being, you know, what the world was before it started moving around. But um, can, maybe you could explain to me, remind me of what Pareto is all about, because you're, you're a research house and um, world affairs consultancy, right? And the sort of wider angle, yeah. geopolitical side. So it covers quite a few things, but uh, what's the significance of Pareto? It's Italian, I believe. Pareto economics comes from Wilfredo Pareto. He was a 19th century, I believe, so economist, engineer, mathematician. And he came up with what is colloquially termed as the Pareto principle. So the 80-20 rule. And this, when looking into this, even, you know, before I even had the concept of changing the name to this, I found it very interesting. And you can apply it to many aspects of human creativity whether it's the companies that are being built and the market share they have, whether it's the nations that are in existence and the financial um, strength they have, the money flows they have, can fall into this prey to distribution. And using this as a core aspect of seeing the, the lens in which you can see the world, you can really make sense of a lot of things. And this is what we try to do as a company. Before we had it, you know, we, we were called Pangea Wire Group, mostly you know, to sort of represent the idea that because of globalization, because of technology, we are, we don't need to be on a single landmass because we're connected in many different ways. And a wire, sort of a news wire where information and news and technology travels very quickly, you need to be, be prepared for it. But uh, the name change really captures more significantly what the company does. And the main starting point for what we do is we really try to answer one specific question, macro question for our clients. And that's how is the world going to be changed and challenged in the next 100 years? The reason we have this 100 years outlook is because we realize that governments as well as corporations tend to have much shorter term outlooks. A government, typically every election cycle is, is how far they think. They may have long-term strategies of, oh, the next 50 years we're going to do this, but if you're not in power, you, you, can't, you can't do much. Corporations, even less, it's every sort of uh, reporting cycle. Every 90 days, they need to have their, you know, their ducks in a row. And saying this 100 years, not, not, we are saying this is the time frames in which our activity is going to be impacted into the future. And we need to have people in companies or we need to have someone responsible for these long-term changes and transitions we have as a human species. And we're at this level, we can't only cut it down into regional markets, you know, sub-regional markets, but our impact in so many different ways is felt by so many different people. And especially in trade finance, where it's sort of the, the, uh, the, the oil that allows the machine to run it plays such a significant role that you cannot take a short-term outlook, especially if you want to plug that trade finance gap of 1.5 trillion, which is extraordinary. And one of the things you told me you've been working on is, um, is coming out soon, I believe, uh, the, the Global Power Index. Now, if you're in trade finance, you do like we do like to abbreviate things, you know, LC, DP, and all that stuff. Have you thought about calling it the GPI? As, uh, it is called the GPI. Oh, okay, well, I didn't actually, well, that yeah. wasn't a setup. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, okay, glad, because uh, we, we in trade, we do like abbreviations. Right. And then many of us work for banks or worked for banks that were abbreviations. So that, that's good. That, we, as we call it, um, a TLA, it's a three letter an acronym, which in, in itself is a TLA. You see that? You know, that's a new one for you. It's double entendre right there. <laughs> so tell me about that, because. In, cause the, the, the word is global power index. In what kind of context are you talking about power? Yeah. So essentially this index is how we have been able to quantify the work that we do. So again, if you take it from the starting point of 
looking at this 100 years outlook, the main, the main sort of depositor of power in this world are nation states and everything comes from them. Regulation is set by them for companies and banks and all kinds of organizations that play by, by the rules. You know, people are, are, are citizens of them. You know, wars happen between them. Trade happens between them. You know, tariffs are placed on the borders between them. So naturally for any, any company which is global or sells into a, a, a global market, um, you need to really understand the trajectory of where nation states are going. And um, this index is a way to quantify the changes that are happening in nation states for nations themselves to find out what they could be doing better to, uh, to increase, let's say, for example, foreign direct investment, but also for investors of different kinds, because investors aren't one sort of type of per person or entity, to really understand the non-financial risks and opportunities that a nation faces. So the macro thesis behind that is pretty long. I can't really get into it right now because it will probably be here for a, a while. But essentially, we're saying that the reason as to why nation states you know, rise in power are fundamentally based on what we call a nation state centers of power, which are six. And these centers of power allow a nation state to become powerful. And this idea doesn't only apply to nation states of today, but of principalities of past, of empires of the past, and of kingdoms of the past. They've always made sense. They've, they've always mattered. The six are, for example, the, uh, nations' geostrategic positioning, their financial strength, their active consumer market, their military balance, their systemically important commodities, which they produce, and also their technological leadership. Throughout history, any empire has been strong because they have maximized themselves in all of these six areas. And if you are not maximized in these six areas, is where we see the developmental differential between nations, which is why America is more powerful, let's say, than Morocco. Not because America somehow is more powerful, but because they've extended themselves maximally on all these six sides in relative to Morocco. So this is a way for investors to see this, and then the back-end research that we've done to create this is one thing, but also the insights you can get from this as an investor, as a, as a trade financier, is incredible. Yeah. Uh, so one of the th things just spurred a thought in me is about, you know, if you're looking ahead, have you thought about countries that may not exist now as nation states, but might be there in the future? Um, and without, I mean, it's quite a hot topic. As, 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 as you know, I'm Scottish. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're talking about, you know, the influence that things have, so I, I can't, this is the, the old Scottish bias thing, you know, t television invented by a Scotsman, um, the telephone, you know, but they were all British, you know, that's the whole thing. Um, so, so have you looked about, you know, countries that may not exist now and you think that might be around? That's where we kind of get to looking to the future because I want to talk to you about what's happening in the future. And that, that's one thing that is, you know, a fairly hot topic in the UK. That's actually a really exciting question, Alex, because this has happened before. And I'll tell you in what context it's happened. When we look at the last time where we had a power struggle in the world, meaning between the Soviet Union and the United States. Those are the two major powers that really had two different ideologies of how to live, that, how, to, how to live and how economics should be managed and how prosperity still should do, be implemented. Still do, right? Yeah, but <laughs> the Soviet, uh, Russia, uh, this is, uh, and, and I'm getting to it, and yeah. watch this. So you had the United States as a nation state and you have the, the Soviet Union as a, uh, as, a, as a nation state but also as a political idea, which was entrenched throughout other nations, right? Uh, you had sort of Albania, which wasn't part of the USSR, but also had the communist ideology. You had China, which, which, which was also communist. We had, you know, uh, Vietnam, which is still communist, and you had Cuba. And also, you know, fighting for other territories in Africa and also Afghanistan and South America, which also tried to... Uh, come in with this fresh or with this um, identity. Well, when, I, when I lived in Calcutta, which was in um, West Bengal, mm. that was a communist yeah. state, and yeah. there was a there was a joke that it'd probably be the last communist state, ever, and, and that was um, living there when uh, various power cuts and things. It was it was a kind of anachronism within communism. Mm, yeah, for sure. I mean, people don't realize that you know communism spreads to so many and there were there were communist parties in so many different countries which now are seen as uh, as democracies but there were there was a struggle there so then what happened was that when the united states or the western liberal democratic democratic idea won out the ussr was broken up into not only russia but now what we call the cis countries so mm -hmm. the nations bordering russia so automatically the ussr had their centers of power which was compounded by all these nations which weren't created 
And then after the USSR fell, these nations became independent and broke off. So they all then developed their own centers of power, to, uh, which were then um, created by these six factors. Mm. So we've had examples in the past where uh, an entity like, like that existed and they got broken up. Now, if you look at Scotland, if you look at, let's say, nor- nor- uh, Northern Cyprus, Taiwan, for example, which is very contentious, Kosovo, and uh, other parts of the world, this can be very easily applied to these nation states if and when they become fully fledged nation states. Mm. So this takes into account these changes and allows you to, again, look at the world through this lens, which is a lot more holistic than just looking at it through a financial lens, which can only capture so much information. Mm. And that's the blind spots that we try to fill with this index. Yeah, no, um, there's a lot of uh, very contentious issues around, um, you know, with, with a certain idea of nation states probably best not to go, go in. Although it's okay for me as a Scotsman to get into the Scottish <laughs> one. But, but um, you know, and, and who knows what might happen in the next few years w- with that. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, your crystal ball, um, looking ahead, you know, because we're coming to the end of, um, what was it, 2021? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's been a strange all year. 2020 was a strange year, but, you know, I think most of us thought that we would be turned the corner and then of course just as we're getting to the end of it um the uh the new omicron yeah. comes in and sort of changes everything and, it, and it's, um, for like um our listeners that uh in various countries out uh, in, uh, around the world you know i'd hope to be traveling by now to visit them that's right i would have been out to the, the middle east china bangladesh um vietnam just to name but a few but i've not been out there um, and you know, I was hoping to do that in the first quarter of next year. I'm, I'm not so sure that is going to happen quite yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but just wondering, you know, uh, maybe your view of next year is, 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 a, is adapted slightly yeah. over the past few weeks, because yeah. um, of course, that's, and what you do, it, it, it's always shifting. Yeah. You, you, you don't know what's going to come around. Yeah. You've got an idea. You've yeah. Got an idea. yeah. But what, so, what do you think about 2020? Two. 2022. Now, it depends on who's asking. If you're asking me from a trade finance point of view, there's a position. If you're asking me from someone who maybe sells popcorn on the streets, it's a different position. If you're asking me if you're a, uh, if you're, if you're a cinema company, it's a different outlook. You have different risks and opportunities. Right. That come I think out, we, right? should, should we should cover the trade, the trade finance, <laughs> I guess so, right? So, so again, this, uh, the, again, the macro thesis that we have is out of the senses of power, four different themes emerge in the world which no matter who you are, no matter if you are a, uh, if you are a producer of uh, cocoa in, in Ivory Coast, for example, it will impact you. If you're a teacher in China, it, it will impact you. If, you are a, uh, if you're a banker in the city of London, where we are right now, it's going to impact you. And these four themes that come up include globalization, geopolitical risk, transformative technology, and societal change. These are the four themes that we see impacting the world a lot more. And what's different about this time period that we are in now is that these four themes are converging at the same time, which is why we see technology being applied to, let's say, the military, or technology being being applied to finance, or geopolitics impacting ESG, or these things which before could have been in their silos more well, more, uh, more strictly are now, the, there's a lot more blurred lines between mm. them. And a traditional point of view, on finance or trade finance or how we do business, this is how we've done it, need, needs to change. Yeah, because so, we can't be saying that this is how we've always done it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you say that's how, we, that's how we, we, we've always done it and it's hard to change, naturally it's hard to change because as, as a company are made up of individuals which have their own biases, which have their own where you are in life as well. You know, you, you, you could be a younger guy or girl, have more energy to do it. You may be a bit older and, you know, want to settle down more and have different plans for yourself. So being professional, you know, quote unquote professional is... Um, is what we try to do on on the best days, but that impacts you, your outlook on the world and who you decide to listen to. Well, we, we had a similar situation at LIBF in terms of last year, where you know we we wanted to make our exams all on demand, all online delivery, but it was a, we knew it was going to be a lot of work, and also we thought that maybe not everybody would be so keen on the concept. You know, um, but needs of being as they were, we we, we did that, um, and it's been a success. I'm glad to say, and you know, a number of the listeners will have done their exams online, or um, they sh- should be booking them up. But I like to say, use this opportunity to remind people who have exams to book, please book them up. 
um, uh, because uh, there's a few, um, even if the, the beauty of it is if they make the booking, they can still change at a later date if, if there's another lockdown, for example. But you know, that was one of those things where it was one of those quite difficult to do and it was like, well, we're, we're going to have to do it. And I think there's been a, a lot of cases of that around the world where people have been putting things off and then it's a situation where if they don't do it, they wouldn't yeah. be around. Yeah. So yeah. spurred exactly. on a lot of people. It needs to be, and especially working from home and all of these different dynamics. Before the pandemic, you know, companies would say, oh, it's too difficult, we can't do it, but they were forced into change. You know, sometimes forcing you to change makes you see a new, a, new, a new perspective. But going back to the themes of 2022, from your point of view, if I were to just ask you, working in the trade finance world more deeply, what ha, what conversations have you heard from your colleagues that you didn't expect to hear last year that they're concerned about? And then maybe I can give some insights into, into that, which is more specific for the audience. Well, it, 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 because of that, the, the um, aspect, it's this trade digitalization. Um, and that's, the, you know, the main focus. And, you know, the ICC, we, uh, UK, um, uh, you know, Chris... Uh, I've spoken to him about that aspect. Um, everything in trade is about digitalization, um, and that has accelerated very, very quickly. Um, and that is because uh, it's one of those same thing, you know, needs must. Um, but then there's also, you know, there, there, it's not in isolation. There, there are some cost savings. It might be some initial costs, but the cost savings. The the, the problem whenever that talked about trade digitalization is about you know the regulatory side the legal side and um you know trying to have some sort of commonality globally and that's with you know standardization um you you have you know in some of the technology early earlier earlier adopters you know the banks with some of the technology they they would rather be a fast follower they'd rather let one bank yeah. I mean, and that's with it, with any technology, you know. Um, you know, people, you know, if they're going to buy a new car, you know, they, a lot of people who got the Tesla early on were, were not, you know, there weren't that many. Now it's people are reliant, they understand the tech, and they're they're, they're keen to have it. But those people who are willing to do early adopt, they're taking a bit of a risk. Mm-hmm. In the same way with uh, you know banks on the digital side, um, so I would say. On the trade world, it, for me, what I hear about mostly, and then I go to the conferences and talking, and also I, I, I do some consultancy work on that as well, it's about trade digitalization. Yeah, that's a big thing. And we weren't going to talk too much about cryptos, but I think we have to go there because <laughs> because um, the fundamental building blocks of crypto is blockchain and efficiency gains, as you mentioned, cost-saving gains are huge if they're applied in, in ways that work. But the trouble is having... having um, these technologies being applied to the trade finance world, you need a focus. You need an organization. You need you need participants in the trade finance world to say we are we are willing to spend ma- time, money, and effort learning about how this can be applied. Which is why organizations like ITFA and you guys here and other organizations are key in making sure that the attention that your members have or your your colleagues have they have a place to meet and discuss to have these things happen in real time. I was on a webinar um, yesterday, a, a panelist um, for the UAE um, uh, Banks, uh, UAE Banks Federation, and it was a, about fraud, and it was a discussion about, you know, consortia, because um, a lot of banks are getting together to do some of these things because um, it, there's economies of scale. and it, But it wasn't about... It was about a case of being like a, you know, a club or a consortium, but not a close, like a, a, a private members club. They, are, they, they want more people to join. Yeah. Um, so that's a slightly different thing, whereas some things in the past might have been slightly more closed. Mm-hmm. The, the, a lot of these things moving forward is they want the, the, the more membership, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll see a lot more of those kind of organizations. Mm-hmm. But, but of course, it's, it's difficult because you've got different banks have different policies and approaches. And... Um, be a number of listeners who have worked with some of these consortia and it c- can be frustrating for some people. Yeah, yeah. But also, if you look at the the, the trade finance world, I mean, what what the pandemic has done most of is maybe stop uh, stop deal flow as much. Meaning, you have producers of commodities across the world because of COVID, they don't have you know workers to then you know 
you know, let's say pick fruits and vegetables or can't go into factories and do things. So their production has slowed down. Demand has also slowed down for the end consumer because they can't go out and spend. So the actual facilitation of trade finance has been less, I, I can assume, since the pandemic has come about because there's no the demand and supply has been so restricted mm. that uh, they want the supply and demand to come back to levels which, which, uh, which can sustain business and which allow maybe smaller banks, which uh, smaller banks and also lending organizations to, to have the incentives to come back and to work again. Not work again in terms of actually coming into the office, but having the deal flow for you to put the money down to secure a trade and to have all the systems in place. And this is what the pandemic has stopped. And this is how much we realize supply chains matter when they go wrong. Because when they go right, no one thinks about it. It's business as usual. But when things like this happen, this is why technology tries to be the bridge to help some of these efficiency gains so that you can actually, the best you can, not have the reason why we didn't develop because we didn't develop the technology. So that's the easiest thing to, to control. The hardest thing to control is a global pandemic and then how do you start with that? But if you can control what kinds of technologies you use, what the standards are, working with the regulators and building a framework, that's what you can control. That's what organized businesses, not businesses, but you know, uh, banks and trade finance functions of banks should be doing more so. Con over communication as opposed to fear and staying in silos. You need to be over communicating with your clients, with your partners across the world. Do you work in the world of trade and transaction banking? Maybe you aspire to work in that sector. Our qualifications are recognized internationally and studied in over 90 countries. Thousands of people qualify with us and progress their careers every year. We have six qualifications that focus on international trade finance, LCs, guarantees, financial crime, payments, and supply chain finance. Wherever you are in your career, we might have the solution to take you to the next level. Find out more at libf.ac.uk forward slash trade. You know, we also t we were talking about you know the people working there, and uh, you know my concern is that um, you know th there isn't much more working from home. Okay, and so even like trade teams, um, and, I, and I talked about it on the, on the, on the, the webinar yesterday is that because people are not sitting beside each other so much, they're not having discussions, whether it be simple, selfish things from LIBS perspective about, you know, doing trade qualifications. Um, they're also not having support. Because, you know, when I was at HSBC, people would do, um, go into meeting rooms at the end of the day and sort of help with working work study groups. They're not so easy to be doing those things um, you know, online. Um, but, you know, from a fraud perspective, you know, people are not, um, you know, they, ha they have a kind of suspicion or something and they can't just go and say to somebody who sits close to them, you know, to having to, like, call them up on a video. And that's what I worry about because there hasn't been so much of this um, interpersonal contact. Um, and then pe so people are not, um, you know, f edu helping with each other with their education, learning as much. Um and also, you know, for on the on the fraud side, you know, that kind of sharing that sort of stuff, because you've got people who are joining organizations who have never actually physically met their colleagues. Um, and then so how do they know that that person is, you know, will willingly help them with a query? Um, it, what you're also not getting is you're not getting somebody overhearing you and saying, if they're a decent person, going, oh, I can help you with that, or I've seen that case before. Yeah. Because you know, so on the trade side, a number of the things that have happened in the, in the past, you know, you learn by your mistakes. Some of the, my biggest learnings while I've been in trade, and I think many of the listeners will identify with this, is when you've made a, a mistake, you know. And uh, some people don't like to, it can be a bit embarrassing when you made a mistake, but I was one if I tried to share those things so that other people wouldn't, especially people within HSBC, you didn't want them making the same mistake you have. And those opportunities in, in all banks and all organizations are not there so much because people are not working as closely as they did in the past. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about how that kind of is going to affect? Because there will be some, you know, some aspects of work where people will have to be close to each other. But how, what do you think about that's going to affect things in the future? Well, this is a question which I think, not to, uh, not to sort of offend your age, but maybe the older <laughs> generation 
uh, think more about because naturally throughout history, we've never really had a situation where you can build companies and work in companies from the comfort of your sofa. So without having an example of how they've done it before, technology may try to overcompensate and provide features in their softwares which help you, but naturally as a human being, you may not use them. And if you don't use them and you're paying for them, that's going to you know impact your bottom line in terms of the services you, uh, you pay for. But on a more human level, um, you need to find a way to have these um, unexpected interactions and having the cohesiveness in a technological way. And the idea of the metaverse is trying to do that, but I don't think nothing will come close like me and you speaking today. Because if we were on Zoom, you know, technological issues, I couldn't see your body language, I, could, I wouldn't know when to come in and talk. Something as easy as this, which for the listener, they enjoy the podcast more. And we haven't been right? saying you're on mute. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is, good. This, this is a big... I think the impacts of this are are going to be felt not now, but probably the next five years, more so. Because an innovation, meaning working from home now, the actual impacts of that can't be felt straight away. You can see this straight away in terms of, like right now, in this place, barely anyone's in the office physically, but they're all at home. But what are you, are they, are people more efficient working from home? That depends on them. And companies are naturally going to have to change their tune. Twitter, for example, have said, now we have a policy where you can work from home all the time. Right. And if you work from home for companies which, where you may not need to be, for example, back end, uh, uh, the, the back end as a finance or treasury or compliance even, um, don't need to be maybe in the room as much as maybe the front end people or the innovators of, 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 of a company. Not to say co- compliance isn't innovative because my wife's in compliance and she's not going to like me saying <laughs> that. Um, but that's the case, you know. Uh, so how do you find people who need to be in a room more together stay in a room, right? That's what you need to figure out. That's each individual company needs to make that, that choice. But to, to go back, if you can, to how 2022, mm. not 2021, 2022, because <laughs> I remember when we met in Helsinki, I, spoke, I said, how is trade finance going to be impacted in 2020, in 2021, right? So we're again, we're kind of full circle almost uh. in February now. So, and this is what I mentioned also then, and it's going to be even more so now. Now, when people, especially in trade finance or, or, or finance in general, hear the word geopolitics, right? The, the department that cares the most is probably, is probably compliance. It's probably the risk function. Mm. Uh, because that's what, that, that is the area of work that's going to be the most impacted. Or you need to be able to see how sanctions impact you, impact that, right? And if you look at the, the state of the world today, we have historical... Um, grievances between the big superpowers which aren't going to be solved anytime soon uh, compounded by the impact of covid compounded by the impact of smaller nation states not trusting the bigger ones as much because uh, you're helping yourselves by over over prescribe uh, over you know over buying you know vaccines and not allowing us to have it causing a lot of frustration i've spoken to nation states you know high level representatives about this and they are frustrated by the lack of action to the words that you know the superpowers have and this was seen by cop uh, uh, 26 and you know last minute they'll come we had india and uh, and china put in some some clauses which allowed them to you know uh, produce coal uh, more so than what they agreed on before Mm. so global trust and global alliance building has been tested by COVID. but if you look at the sanctions world for example this is something that every compliance person should know or probably does know is that when Putin and uh, Biden had their teleconference today and yesterday, because it, it goes on for a few days, and let's say if Biden does put heavy sanctions on Russia because of their planned activities in invading, quote unquote, Ukraine, okay, who's that going to impact the most? Naturally, trade finance is going to feed it because those exporters from Russia can't then export their pork or can't export whatever to Western markets. So, uh, the amount of money that you can make as a, tri- fi- as a, as a trade finance facilitator is going to be less. And especially if it's a market as big as Russia, it's going to be less. And if this is popping up all across the world, because of, a, as we go back to a nation centers of power, nation and geopolitics being a bigger factor, you know, tariffs going up even, so uh, tariffs going up or non-tariff uh, restrictions, this is going to lessen trade amongst nation states, which is going to have a big impact on a trade finance bottom line. Well, I saw that years ago, you know, with Iran in the Middle yeah. East, you know, um, where suddenly there was a whole load of uh, banks were doing a lot of business with Iran and then couldn't, and yeah, their bottom line, that's right. and that will happen 
you know, yeah. other cases of that yeah. happening throughout the world. I can, the yeah. I can tell you some stories offline after this about some big cases of companies, you know, really seeing the impact of this. And actually companies need to have a united front, but it impacts them big time afterwards, you know. So again, geopolitics becomes a big issue for, for trade for trade funds. Globalization becomes a big, big topic. And as technology impacts us speaking here today with Zoom, it's going to impact in a bigger way things of scale like trade finance, which uh, given the trade finance gap now, which you know, last time I checked was 1.5 trillion. I right. do. I do wonder how they work it out. Yeah. Um, but because the number I hear it's, it's opportunity me because it, it's the opportunity missed. So the, ah. they're, they're probably looking at, at what what businesses right now are functioning in in the areas where trade finance is less developed, and what could be the opportunity gain if they were to be have if they were to be offered trade finance services. But the number I hear is always about yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in about one and a half trillion. Something like this. And I had a conversation with uh, Duarte Pedrera from Crown Agents. He's a good friend of mine. And, he, you know, he spoke about, you know, smaller banks, which are more domestic banks in Africa and in, in other parts of the world who operate there, have more of a more of a hands-on approach to what's happening there. And they're probably more able, more willing to uh, to set foot because you have compliance issues with anti-money laundering, financial crime, which no one wants to get in trouble with at all because the, the, um, the uh, reputation risk alone Will be enough to 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 cause big troubles. Let alone, you know, the the financial impacts of that and everything else along with that. So, which is natural because no one wants to be facilitating financial crime. But in areas where nations, their their own uh, compliance or their own regulations aren't as developed, you're going to have these gaps in trade finance. And those who are working on it are trying their best way to have uh, maybe non-banking players, maybe even family offices. We have uh, an Andre Custom and a friend of mine who's working on these solutions as we speak on the digitization of trade finance and finding solutions. But for big corporations, like you mentioned HSBC, you know, to adopt them, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of security, a lot of assurances they need to have that they're doing the right thing because they're, you know, too too big to be in trouble uh, again, I guess, for these things. So these, these are issues which need a, you need a key person in an organization that really focus on it and, and works with innovators to try to find solutions to this. And globalization, uh, sorry, ge- geopolitics, I think, is something which is probably the least understood by by the banking world. And I say that, you know, very confidently, only because we have, let's say, the oil and gas world, which operate in these fields a lot more. Uh, Literally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're there on the ground doing so. They have more of a, an understanding and awareness of how geopolitics impacts them. Banks... Uh, Right now, we have mostly we have you know Western banks going to, to to Asia and across the world, and some Asian banks penetrated here, right? But the the foreign banks which come into Western markets don't really need to think about geopolitics as much because it's more or less more stable than it is the other way around. So, I for example, I'm not going to say who, but I had a conversation with this asset manager a long while ago, and we were just speaking about uh, he was a chief investment officer, and I said to him, so who does your geopolitics? Like how how do you guys focus on this? Because for them, investing in emerging markets, you need to have someone, I believe. Mm. That's focusing on things. Oh, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't do geopolitics. That's oh, why? So we read the FT. You know. So I thought, why? Well, if that's the level of due diligence that you're having, you know, uh, this is going to be. This is incredible. So you find these stories in different organizations, especially if you're based in 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 the, in the city. You're in a bubble. You know, really much so. Well, that does help you for your work, surely. It, exactly. But then that's when I thought, listen, if this is if this is the case, this is the case here. How do you capture these people who? may believe it's important but haven't seen solutions to this which is what we're doing with mm. our, our with our, with the index is a, is a way in easy way in to understand the world we have different sort of innovations that we're developing which is a good way to see it to compare it and then to jump in with what you need to understand and we can provide that for you because just when we talk about ge- geopolitical risk you know you can talk about it on so many different levels exactly. and you know there's 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 some more simplification, simplified yeah. ways, and, and then people will maybe s- that probably touches on the things they may be reading the press. Yeah, headline um, risk that comes up, people uh, read and they get afraid. Yeah, so then they'll see things about say China and Taiwan, yeah. Russia and Ukraine, yeah. uh, Scotland and England. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, but, you know, they'll, but they'll see those those things, but then they won't be looking in more closely and then thinking about the implications because if you know. It, it, when I was at high school, you know, people used to do, before these computer games, Dungeons and Dragons, and they'd be thinking about different implications. You go along one route, and I suppose that's what you have to do yourselves on the geopolitical side. You think, of, because you go along one route, and that f- 
means that there's a whole avenue and it can split on different ways. Yeah. But it's each time it's about something, some event happens well, which will dictate the next route. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like must be sort of a big sort of matrix you're looking yeah. at. Uh, this is the conversations we have with clients all the time. We come in when you know the proverbial you know s h i t hit, hits the fan, mm. you know, and what do we do? And you should have thought about this, you know, before a few years ago, before the egg hatched, you know. Yeah. Not right now. And if you call us in right now, then it's going to be a lot more for you to fix. So, what kind of kind of? I obviously can't talk about specific cases. What what kind of things have you seen in the past where maybe a bit of foresight on the geopolitical side could yeah. have saved somebody? Listen, it depends on who you're saying. With 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 the, with the bank, I think it's more clinical because they have. It's easier with our clients in the banking world than it is maybe for our clients in the oil and gas world or in the tech world or even in the, in the NGO space. Each person, each organization have, have their have their own um, needs, you know. When we speak to, you know, banking or financial clients, it's more sort of what should we be aware of in the long term because their individual practices are so big that to execute on smaller things is hard to to do with sort of a workshop or hard to do with a report, you know. But the thing that I find the most is that when we speak to anyone we speak to, when we speak about ge- geopolitics, the first thing that the biggest names, Russia, China, Iran, are the first things that come up. But in reality, you know, the biggest impact that is in your business may not be any of these guys. Mm. It could be Mongolia, right? It could be Nepal. It could be what's happening here. It could be something which, which you connect to geopolitics only because there's a politician speaking, you know? Well, well, at our annual trade finance compliance conference, we, we, one of the things we were talk, talking about trying to understand from, you know, especially on the people on the sanctions side, was about what do they see as future issues, you know. So, but you know that was already, you know, this was just after um, the troops had left Afghanistan, so that was already aware of. And then you know the Russian piece, the China piece; those are all things that are being a aware of but they, they talked about a few other cases where you know you're looking further ahead that you can see sort of um rumblings um so what kind of thing do you see anything like that of you know issues that you see further ahead and that may be a, you know the ones that we're not seeing in the headlines i get this question a lot whether it's on whether it's podcast or whether it's you know people asking me just what are the things that we're not oh, paying attention to? Same old question from Alex. You know? <laughs> but I think I think it's, it's it's not about what you're not paying attention to, but how do you interpret what's happening, mm. right? As opposed to what's not, because everything is being paid. Like with this, the way that the world works, everything, everyone has a spotlight somewhere. But mm. it's do you see it, you know? But the one thing which I ask even I, I ask like how do you define geopolitics, you know? And it's hard. And then I say so how do you define political risk? They say, well, it's the risk of politics. Well, how do you find geopolitical risk? And they, they're stumped. But these things, as definitions, are very clear. You know, and so, sometimes starting with the basics to understand the framework of how you should be thinking is important. For example, to give your, your audience a, uh, some sort of steps to understand it, political risk, for example, are risks which happen within a nation state, right? Within a country. So it's regulatory. It's, it's part of it is, is, is what the what a government is doing, which stops you from doing business in that country or hinders you from doing business in that country. So that right? would, so that uh, as an example, that yeah. could be you know, the stuff related to the HS two. You know, yeah. they, they would have it in the leads, and then they decided not to, and that would have ramifications. Yeah, exactly. So that's a political. That's thing. a political risk, right? So it's what decisions they're making dem- for the domestic market. That okay. Could, that could have, that's a political risk. A geopolitical risk are risks which come about between nation states. Right, so bilateral or multilateral risk. So that's things like sanctions, right? That's things like Russia wants to invade Ukraine. How does that impact us? So between nations, that's a geopolitical risk. So something. So in, just uh, to help with my uh, my understanding of that. So something that you know. Uh, so climate change. Yeah. You know, yeah. All that cops, that's all geopolitical. That's all because it's between nation states, right? Yeah. And people think Juba is, is only about guns and, and, and bullets and tanks. No, it's, it's, it's between nations and that, what conversation they're having. That's the risk that you face as a business. But then, of course, but it's all, a lot of it stems from the political risk because a country, let's say the UK, has a policy or, mm. you know, for climate change, yeah. but that will um, impact other countries, won't it? For example, look... Um, yeah, because you, you have things like Brexit, which are both political and geopolitical, right? Because it impacts the domestic. But let's say, for example, uh, uh, raising tax on, on, on gin, right? 
for a producer of gin in the UK, that could be again a political risk for a for a gin importer. Could be a, a, ge- a geopolitical one, right? But you can't. People interchange these two things as if it's the same thing. Like in, in in corporate insurance, you have political risk, right? Not geopolitical risk. You have terrorism risk for for that because it could more be of how other non-state actors are impacting the world. But political risk is very well defined even in the insurance market. It's it's the risks that are caused by political decisions on business. The, on the domestic markets. So it's something as simple as that. And also just for your audience to know, it, it, it's maybe a little plug that we're developing a, a world affairs dictionary, which defines some very basic concepts and concepts that we've developed ourselves, i.e. the sense of power or global power index, development of differential. We're creating a, a dictionary which explains these terms to, to a financial or any audience which wants to learn about them, which gives you straight definition and examples of them, just so you know what language you're using. Oh, yeah. Because sometimes the difference of language, like even using acronyms can be confusing, let alone mm-hmm. actual words, which people may have a perception of what they mean. Make it being very clear on what you're saying and what you mean is really a good step to having a, a clear strategy in the future. Well, yeah, but with an acronym, or with abbreviations or whatever, yeah. in depending on what context, if you, so if you look up something yeah. uh, on, uh, on the internet, Depending on what context, it can be four or five different things. Exactly. It can be different to a logistics company than to a bank. Exactly. Um, um, so, in terms of, uh, we we'll have to like close in a few minutes. But to just um, thinking about f- the future, um, you, we covered quite a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But what would you say? You know, it's the in, in terms of your looking ahead for twenty twenty two. Yeah. What is your kind of what you should do? Yeah. I think you should pay less attention to headline risk. Because if it's out on Bloomberg, it's already happened. Yeah, it's you know? too late. It's too, if the journalists are there, then there's no point. And this so it's like, like the stock market. Yeah, exactly. If, if people are talking about that, but yeah, yeah. it's too late. The door, yeah. the horse is bolted, yeah. right? I mean, we've done surveys with 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 audience, and we asked them, you know, uh, what are what are the ways in which you learn about geopolitical risk, for example? And they say, well, the majority of it is just newspapers. Do you do anything deeper than that? Not really. So if you're only reading newspapers, like that newspaper isn't written just for you and your business. So paying attention so much and then bringing it into the office, oh, let's talk about this. I mean, this could be a good introduction to the topic, but you can't then make this off, off, the, off the basis of, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a news uh, headline. So less, less of that and more going to the source. So that's something that you can do more so. So for example, if a report comes out, read the, don't read the interpretation of the, of the report through a newspaper or through a blog or through your daily newsletter or email that you get, highlights, right? Who cares, but highlights don't don't give you trajectory, you know? Well, in that, so in that respect, when I listened to the news this morning, and I, it was about Australia are not gonna be involved diplomatically with the Winter Games in yeah. China. Yeah. But I'm thinking, okay, I'm just hearing about that now, but yeah. that must have been going on for ages. They've made decisions about this before it came out, and they wish that some things wouldn't come out in the news, right? So if you're only capturing it through sort of the, the conduit, you're not capturing everything. You're not capturing the whole value. So but to go more to, to to the source. That's the thing that we do. If you have any 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 reports that are quoted, anything that you go to the source, read it in, in its full context. That's that that way you can really learn more about it. You know, because that's on a good example of like a geopolitical thing. So you've got um, a situation between China and Australia, and you know it's about in theory it's about the support, but it's not. It's much, way more. But that's going to impact. You know. The, a farmer in you know in in Australia, um, or or people who are looking to buy products importing from China, and suddenly, overnight, their whole world has been turned upside down. They'll pro- probably um, because of that they'll be uh, um, if they're importing say wool or or lamb from from Australia. That, that's probably going to be a lot more difficult now, mm-hmm. and just so that's where the kind of those people haven't yeah. sort of thought about Again, how do you connect those dots by just a news article you know how because listen i'm on tv a lot i'm not saying that to, to, to <laughs> remember, but I, I'm a, I get contacted by, by by journalists almost on a daily basis for my insights in fact i was going to meet someone today uh he's probably i'm going to share this podcast i think he knows who he is i was going to meet him today but he but he, he he could he couldn't make it and um but i get these requests all the time just to speak right and journalists want to get your insights into it, and then they put together a piece from their own knowledge of the situation. But a journalist is not going to have uh, access to, for example, the decision-making processes of the cabinet. So they're going to give you what they can as a summary to help you understand the high levels. But if mm. you take these high levels and make decisions off the base of it, 
that's where you go wrong straight away, straight away. You know, you need to, or better yet, hire us and we can help you, <laughs> essentially, if you want. But without going, uh, with, without saying it that uh, I mean, obviously. The same way when I join other people for their podcast, I always do a plug for LIBF. Yeah. So, I, I can, you know. Yeah. I can, for example, <laughs> because even even if you sit down with us for an hour to talk about what what's going on, even to do sort of like a health check MOT on, on 2022, right? What are your plans? What do you want to achieve? What should you focus on? You may have gaps in X, Y, and Z. How do you fill these gaps? What what members of the team are working on this, right? What sources should you be should should you be reading more of and less of? You know what? Where are you getting the information from? You know, uh, this is what you should be focusing on. This is what you could be doing better or worse, just to set you up more. Just like you speak to a personal trainer, you may not train that person every single day, but they give you the meal plan, what you should be doing. It's up to you to stick to it, right? And if you stick to, it, you see benefits, then you know this person works. You've you know, just so remind, tested. You just just reminded me. I've just started doing that with an online fitness and yeah, health thing yeah. so uh, you um, can do zoom calls as well don't worry <laughs> i'm not starting to feel guilty about that. <laughs> but no, so that uh so what the people who are listening to this and might be, they will be able to get in touch with you on linkedin because yeah, yeah. you're you're yeah, active there yeah, as right well and um you know we can provide some details uh, yeah so yeah that's the beauty of being in the same room as christian exactly. he's giving me the nod yeah. as opposed to giving me the, yeah. the eyes across his mask like yeah. Yeah, he's giving me a nod <laughs> so we're all okay so that's we can right. pass on your details that's so people fine. might that's be fine. interested yeah. but i'm active on linkedin or i write a lot about different topics even thoughts that i've just put it there engage with people you know sp- speak what you what what you think people need to know through just, not through just any sort of marketing way or saying something for the or just having you know these days I see a lot of LinkedIn a lot of um a lot of uh what is it polls mm. that people do just you know, obvious things like do you like sleeping during the day or the night right obviously it's, but they, they just want to get the attention on them mm. you know but if if you do that you know you're not saying what you should be saying so LinkedIn Twitter I guess a little bit uh, website that's where you can find me. Cool. But yeah, well, thanks very much for coming in. Yeah, as, as, as we're set here in London, most of our listeners are outside London, and uh, they won't. Be, there's a storm coming in, a storm barra, mm-hmm. the, and so we probably best get away before it hits. Yeah. It's getting dark outside, but the good thing about London at this time of year, when it does get dark, we've got lovely Christmas lights. So as we step out into the cold, we'll have a Christmas uh, feel about. It. Just like to say, Clisman, thanks very much for joining us. Thank um, you so much. And thanks to Christian, because uh, this is his cool back to, he's got his he's got his brand new equipment. He's literally like a boy in a sweeting sh- sweetie shop here with all his new equipment. He's finally getting to use it. Uh, so thanks to you, Christian. And uh, to all our listeners, uh, all the best to the festive season, no matter how uh, you celebrate that. And, that, you know, at some point, uh, it'll be into, we'll be getting to 2022. And then maybe at the end of next year, we'll get maybe make this an annual thing where we'll get, you get back. We'll, we'll take notes on what you predicted. And, uh, but, that, but thanks very much. And to all listeners, uh, all the best for the coming year. Thank you. Thank you.